So the question is, um, uh, why are the big tech companies uh, and their brands so valuable? And that's really, of course, um, two questions. Um, and my presentation is going to be very plain vanilla. In other words, I'm going to tell you what I said I was going to tell you. So you'll be relieved to hear that. Um, clearly, if, if we have this uh, dominance of the very big tech companies, that is because what they've managed to do is build a dominant market share in large profitable markets. And the question is, therefore, um, what are the things about the markets and the companies which uh, make that happen? We have this wonderful quote from Peter Thiel, who puts it all very clearly, competition is for losers. If you want to create and capture lasting value, look to build a monopoly. Um, and so with the US companies, uh, we've got uh, the GAFA companies and Microsoft. Uh, with China, we have uh, the BAT companies um, plus Huawei uh, and others. Uh, pretty much everyone else, apart from Samsung, which uh, actually brand finance has classified as a conglomerate, but is, is sort of a tech company as well, uh, is, is um, left behind. Now, if we're looking for why do we have this situation, the answer is there are multiple reasons, not a single reason. And I'm reminded of my favorite American lawyer joke, which I was told, I do, like David, I do expert witness work from time to time. I was, let me say, told this by an American lawyer. And it's about um, an experimental psychology uh, lab in the US where they stopped sending rats down tunnels and they started sending young out of work lawyers uh, instead. And the director was fed up with taking phone calls from journalists. So he said, we're going to have a press conference and just bring all the media together and just deal with this thing. And he says, look, everyone assumes there's a big single reason. There is not one big single reason. There are multiple reasons. Number one, there are a lot of young out of work lawyers, plenty of them, good supply. The second is they're pretty much as quick as the rats were at working out which tunnels to go to. They respond to incentives in a very direct way and so on. And the third reason, which may be less obvious, is with the rats, we found after a time we were starting to lose our scientific objectivity because we got emotionally attached uh, to them. <laughs> and um, that doesn't seem to be happening so much. Oh, finally, there were some things the rats wouldn't do. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying we have the same situation here. What I am saying is don't look for a single reason. Okay? There are multiple mutually reinforcing reasons why tech markets are winner-take-all. And therefore, not necessarily the first mover, because in many cases it wasn't the first mover, but the person who built the dominant share during the crucial early growth phase of the market then becomes so dominant in these markets. The first is just Economics 101, high fixed costs, low variable costs, classical economies of scale and scope uh, and learning, basically driven by very low marginal costs. The second is there are two kinds of network effect. Everyone knows network effects are important. What not, not everyone has sussed out is that there are these two kinds of network effects. So there's the traditional direct within market network effect. And the uh, classic uh, example of this uh, was uh, 1996 uh, Hotmail. And some very bold people bought a lot of servers and offered email for free to early adopters of what was then still mostly dial-up uh, internet. And this is just the most pure example of viral marketing, that being able to do email isn't useful if no one else who you want to communicate with is on email. Therefore, Hotmail was able to say, recruit your friends, it's free. They didn't have a model for monetizing it, but they set it up in 1996. And then in 1997, they sold it to Microsoft for $400 million. Okay? And then micro it became the Microsoft email and so on, MSN uh, mail and so on. So that is in the nature of communication technologies, particularly when there are standards, uh, which is you know, if you're the only person in the world 
who has a telephone, you have a great status symbol, but it's not, it has no functionality. So the classic direct within market network effect is that the more other people who have the same product, the more valuable the product is to you. What we have in addition, which is now more important, is the indirect between market network effects, which uh, the technical term in economics is multi-sided markets, or just more loosely, uh, platform economics. And that is the sort of Airbnb uh, type model, which is that um, the more people who are uh, on one side, of, in, in one of the markets, namely the more people who've got uh, uh, properties which they'd like to uh, make available to people on short breaks, uh, the better it is for people who want to go on that system because they've got more choice, and vice versa. The more people there are who are looking, then the more valuable it is to go on Airbnb. And so that's a very powerful platform network effect, which in various ways applies to uh, all of these uh, tech businesses. Uh, they're all platform businesses. Um, obviously, big data and machine learning. And the thing about big data is, uh, I mean, in, in the world of market research, the word big isn't so important. What big data tends to mean in market research is data which were not collected for insight purposes, as opposed to traditional market research, which is, is data collected for insight purposes. Um, and therefore, in marketing, we're very often using data which are generated, let's say, by operations or the complaints, people handling complaints and so on, and repurposing it and so on. But in the world of tech, the word really is big. Okay, so all of those wonderful free services offered by Google, Google Maps and all of those things, um, there are various reasons for doing it. It reinforces the brand and so on. But one very big reason is with big data, more is more. And uh, once you're setting your algorithms going, the more data they have to play with, the more powerful the results will be. Um, and uh, in terms of regulation, we really you know, aren't even at the races in knowing how to handle that or, or really understanding the economics of that. There are various switching costs um, and various forms of lock-in, uh, which, which are sort of more behavioral. Um, there's... Uh, of course, this, uh, I mean, Matt mentioned the sort of the libertarian uh, US culture. Silicon Valley is even more so um, sort of extreme uh, libertarianism, uh, very hard driving companies. But something which people, I think, underestimate is geographical clustering. So if you, if you look at, you know, what are the things in common across GAFA and Microsoft, three of them are in Silicon Valley, two of them are in Seattle. Okay, so they're in a very small uh, geographical area, and that matters, and it matters again for ways we, I think, half understand to do not so much, it's partly human capital, which is just, you know, getting talent and creating a local labor market and so on, but a lot of it's about social capital, which is the interaction between people and competing for success and so on. So the uh, cluster economics, uh, which, which is why the city of London is still the city of London, um, which is why um, probably most of the best um, uh, ceramic tiles in the world are made in a small area of North Italy and so on. Th this, is, this is one of the sort of areas of, of economics which I think people underestimate. In 1997, a very bright economist um, uh, journalist at The Economist uh, called Francis Cancross wrote a book, you know, this is in the middle of the uh, first internet bubble, called The Death of Distance, saying that because of the internet, distance would no longer matter. That turned out to be almost entirely wrong. Hollywood is still in Hollywood. Silicon Valley is still in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, 20 years later. And this is extremely relevant, incidentally, in the context of Brexit, that, that uh, you know, one of the uh, assumptions of the enthusiastic Brexiteers is that geography doesn't matter uh, anymore with both goods and services. Interestingly, uh, you know, the Chinese Belt and Road Project is, is a very explicit, extremely expensive, very large project aimed at reducing the importance of economic geography by, by sort of 
a step change in infrastructure uh, between uh, Asia and Europe and Africa to a lesser extent. So don't underestimate the importance of geographical clustering. It's hugely, hugely important. And because it's a bit intangible, I think people do underestimate it. And then uh, we've got uh, brands. And uh, remember, these are talent brands as well as consumer brands. All right, the people, people uh, want to work for uh, these big tech companies because it's good to have uh, on your CV. Um, something we now know, which, which goes against what many marketers believe, is that other things being equal, executives are willing to be paid less to work for a company with strong brands. And the reason for that is they get a reputational benefit themselves if they work for a company with strong brands. That effect is stronger for chief executives who are most identified with the brand. Uh, it is also, other things being equal, stronger for younger executives who have more of their career ahead of them. So it's not the case that CEOs, CFOs don't understand that brands uh, are important. And obviously the fact that quite a few of us for 20 years 30 years have been banging on about the importance of brands, you know, may have had some effect, including, of course, brand finance. But um, uh, don't underestimate the employee dimension of brand value as, as well as the uh, consumer dimension. Uh, the reason why I've got such sort of uh, uh, a surprising depth of knowledge about this is I've just written a book chapter about it, by the way, so that's, that's um, the reason I'm sort of fairly up to speed on the fact that there's this full range of things. Uh, Moore and Tambini, Moore is at uh, King's College London, Tambini is at the London School of Economics. Their book, which comes out on the 1st of July, is mainly about the citizenship issues that Matt touched on, uh, the social and political impacts, particularly some of the negative impacts of digital dominance. But they asked me to do chapter one, which was to say, so why did we, <laughs> You know, why are we in this situation? How and why? So we tell the five individual stories of, of Gaffer and Microsoft. But I think the main thing is, say, they have a great deal in common in terms of these uh, reasons. Now, one effect of this, and this is extremely important in terms of sort of regulation and also the relationship between Europe and the US, which is, I think, going to be quite fraught about this in the next five, 10 years, uh, is that Tech winners can be eclipsed but not displaced. Now, I am older than most people think. I actually graduated in 1968, and I joined IBM. And at that time, there was a thing called System 360. Most of you are too young, you know, you know you've read about it in history books. But IBM had roughly a two-thirds global market share in mainframes. And then there were the seven dwarfs and all the smaller companies. And actually, it's interesting, if you look back, at um, you know, the mainframe market in the late 1960s, um, most of those things did apply. They didn't all apply. Um, there were certainly economies of scale, scope, and learning. One of our competitors, the main British competitor, was called ICL. Um, our R&D budget was bigger than ICL's turnover. All right, now clearly, that's a, a winner-take-all uh, type of, of situation. Um, there were network effects in the sense that if one player has 65% global market share and the next big, biggest player has 6% market share, and you're thinking of becoming a computer programmer or a computer operator, which one are you going to be motivated to learn about? The one with the 65% share or the one with the 6.5% share or even smaller? So, we did, I think, have those, nature, those, those uh, network effects. Big data is more recent. Big data was not relevant. There were huge switching costs and lock-in. There was a corporate culture. It was a little bit different. IBM was slightly like a religion, but only slightly like a religion. It was mostly tall, I have to say. I was an exception, tall, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Um, and there had been a company songbook, and unfortunately, by the time I joined, <laughs> Certainly in the UK, there wasn't. There were also, it was set up by Methodists, and it was completely to teetotal until they went to France, and then they simply couldn't recruit anybody, to, to, you know, expecting not to have a glass of wine at lunch. Um, 
and brand, okay? I think it was mentioned uh, yesterday. Uh, I mean, the IBM brand still, hugely important brand. The expression was, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. And so we did not compete on price, okay? We really looked after people who were then called DP managers. So um, if you say, you know, in the 1960s, uh, IBM dominated the mainframe market. Who do you think dominates the mainframe market today? IBM. Okay, so after all that time, IBM has not been displaced from its leadership of that market, but it has been eclipsed initially by PCs. They actually signed a very dumb deal with Microsoft, you know, at the beginning of the PC thing. Uh, and, and so PCs then became a bigger market. Microsoft and Intel you know, software and, and, and chips then became dominant, okay? And then when we had the World Wide Web, which started in 1990, Microsoft and Intel continued to dominate the PC market, as they still do, but there were these multiple new markets. There was search, e-commerce, social networking. That's the rest of GAFA. Um, and then we had the mobile uh, internet, year zero for the mobile internet, 2007, the first iPhone. And so that is actually a duopoly, not a monopoly, uh, because um, Google slash Android and Apple, one of them dominating the premium end, one of them dominated the, uh, the bigger end. And then, of course, we've got uh, the various mobile apps, which, again, tend to be dominated by the GAFA companies. Um, and others uh, mainly in the US and China. So really important when you're thinking about how does competition work in these markets is that um, a lot of the rhetoric, the libertarian rhetoric of um, Silicon Valley uh, rightly says, you know, these are, these are competitive markets. At a certain level, the barriers to entry are quite low. You know, no one makes you keep using Google. Um, so, uh, and you know, as a consumer, you're doing very well. You're getting very high quality services, which are free. From an advertising viewpoint, uh, very often the advertising is sold through uh, an automated auction. So you're paying a market price. What's not to like? Well, what's not to like uh, is, is a combination of, of the negative citizenship impacts which we're starting to explore and which are very difficult to handle and you know Zuckerberg's number one uh, issue for this year is you know how do we maximize the pro-social benefits of social media and minimize the the dysfunctional aspects okay really important really difficult but it's not that this is all about creative destruction and you know everything's happening at light speed uh, and, and, you know, next year we may no longer, you know, Google may no longer be dominant in search. That ain't going to happen. This whole combination of reasons, okay, and these are sort of multiplicative, those are very powerful. So it's, it would be very surprising if any of these got eclipsed from their market. The danger for them is mainly that another market comes along, they don't spot it, uh, and therefore they are... Um, eclipsed rather than displaced. Um, briefly, why are the big tech brands so valuable? Well, this is the top 10 tech brands um, in, in the 2018 uh, brand finance list. It doesn't actually count Samsung, which comes in at number four, just above Facebook. Uh, Samsung is, is actually listed as a conglomerate rather than a tech brand. Most of us would, would probably count Samsung now as a, as a as a tech brand as well. So, you know, tremendous dominance. And as David says, this is the first time that's happened. Why? Well, the first thing you see the answers to question one, all right, is that, is that um, the tech brands are so dominant because the tech companies are, are so dominant and their market cap is so high. Slightly less obvious, these services tend to be experience goods, which in economics means um, you need to try the brand or the product or the service in order to evaluate quality, that increases the value of trusted brands, particularly for new customer acquisition. 
the other thing is these part of the um, whole culture of, of Silicon Valley is the importance of founders and founders remaining in charge. It so happens that in particular, Steve Jobs uh, and Bezos um, really get the value of brand. And uh, David, again, has quoted Bezos, who at the time of the original <laughs> IPO said online brands are more, even more important than offline brands. Um, and, uh, you know, he, the, the quote that you know, your brand is what people say about you when you're not there, and all of that. Um, a brand for a company is like a reputation to a person. You earn reputation by trying to do hard things well. Um, and these are very well-run companies, by the way. You know, they attract very good talent. Finally, I'm going to um, do a segue into the uh, rest of the conference, which is about non-digital brands. What's the relevance of digital for all the other brands? Uh, and you're going to hear some great presentations from people about how they're, how they're navigating this di digital world in order to keep maximizing both short-term profit and the long-term value of brands. Well, brands in the digital world, I, with a little bit of trepidation, I looked back at something I wrote 21 years ago about this. This was a, um, an editorial in the Journal of Brand Management. Now, um, a, a, again, David touched on this. In the 90s, we did hear a great deal of nonsense, and you know, like profit and cash flow were rather sort of unfashionable. It was all about eyeballs and so on. One of the things which people were saying then, and they are sort of still saying it, to a slightly lesser degree, was that digital spelt the death of brands. Okay, that, that what we we're moving towards was a world uh, of intelligent smart agents buying on behalf of people, increasingly voice controlled. That actually took longer than predicted, but it's happening now. And therefore, you know, people will sort of sim say the equivalent of Alexa, get me X. Now, of course, that somewhat depends what X is. So Alexa, buy me a car. I don't think so, <laughs> right? Alexa, you know, buy some yogurt. Well, maybe can, you know, going through the list and including yogurt, or maybe not voice controlled. You know, the way the way uh, Ocado and so on. And uh, the presumption was, and occasionally this still resurfaces. The presumption is because brands are a sort of way of cheating consumers into paying more than they should for perfectly ordinary products. Therefore, that's going to be exposed by this technology, and purchasing is all going to be on price. And so it was predicted you know, by various people, along with a great deal of other nonsense, like television would disappear and so on, uh, that, um, or TV advertising, that brands would sort of decline. So I asked Brand Finance for my final slide, so, you know, can you look back uh, from when you first started publishing uh, your 500, what's the combined value of the uh, top 50? And lo and behold, um, you know, as I predicted in 1997, otherwise obviously I wouldn't be showing it to you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, of course, the, the, the combined value of brands, of, of, of the top global brands, uh, keeps increasing. Now, um, there was a little bit of a dip, uh, you know, after the financial crisis, 2008, not a very big dip. Okay, the nature of brands is a brand is like a kind of flywheel for your business. It takes a lot of energy to build up a strong brand. Fortunately, it's actually quite difficult, even for the stupidest brand manager, to do much damage to uh, a very well-established brand because they exist in people's uh, heads, um, and you know you can't directly control that. But um, with that sort of slight dip, uh, now. Whether you think that will continue may partly depend on whether you think you know current equity prices are sort of another bubble or whatever. But you know it is absolutely not the case that uh, digital means we no longer have uh, you know value. Consumers have value. Firms have value uh, in uh, established, well-known, uh, trusted brands. Um, from this, uh, I think you're going to see quite a few examples of you know, individual companies and, and the way they're managing their brands in this digital world to provide the sort of substance behind that. So, um, any questions at uh, this point? We have uh, microphones 
uh, either side. Yes, question here. What's your assessment of... I'm sorry, uh, who are you? The, the sorry, Phil McCauley. What's your, what's your assessment of um, the likely brand value position given Brexit for UK companies? Um, well, I think unlike David and like Matt, I'm, I'm a bit of a... Uh, I, I, you know, voted Remain. Um, I personally think Brexit may not happen. Um, <laughs> And uh, that is because I think there's quite a good chance of a second referendum. Um, we, you know, we've, we've just been told that we can't see the government's own assessment of the economic impact until after the deal is agreed. Then Parliament will be allowed to see that assessment. Um, it seems to me at that point, um, both for Parliament and the British public, it's reasonable to say now we know more about the likely consequences and what has been agreed. Um, we should go back to the people, particularly since the main Brexit argument is respect, respect the views of the 51.8% of those who voted who voted, voted Brexit. So I'm, I personally don't think Brexit is a done deal at all. Uh, if there is a second referendum at that point, uh, my personal expectation is that uh, the first one will be reversed by actually quite a wide margin, uh, partly because of demographic changes and the young people actually getting out and voting and things like that. But also I think there are, you know, the trend, uh, the number of people who voted remain who would change their mind that way I think would be very small. The number who voted Brexit, who would then say, now I see the consequences and all this stuff about Northern Ireland will be in the customs union and won't be in the, you know, all of those problems. Assuming Brexit goes ahead, then of course it hugely depends on, you know, hard versus soft uh, kind of Brexit. The fundamentals, uh, if we're talking about British brands, the fundamentals of brands never change, all right? The reason why brands have value uh, to companies is because they have value to customers and that isn't going to change. Um, I think that there'll be a very small uh, sort of brand Britain effect, uh, which may be very slightly tarnished. Um, it's a thing we're already seeing at LBS, it's a thing the city is already seeing, which is the idea uh, of Britain being a, a little bit sort of xenophobic, um, whereas particularly in London, we've always had a great reputation for openness and welcoming people here, and I think that may be slightly tarnished. Having said that, you know, I don't see, um, I don't see a massive brand effect on top of the main business impact, and I think the business impact is negative, and I think the, the, the reasons it's negative are sort of rather boring you know, tariff and non-tariff barrier type reasons and, um, you know, the difficulty of recruiting and, and um, the best talent in the world. And if you look at the Silicon Valley view of, uh, you know, the 45th president's immigration policies, it's totally, totally negative. If you go to America and you want to see a decent cricket match, go to Silicon Valley, okay? Where there are Indians, there is cricket. In Silicon Valley, um, there are Indians, therefore there is cricket. And um, that is, um, that's, you know, very much part of the DNA of Silicon Valley. So my fear is we might lose some of that. So I think the business impact is potentially significant and negative. The specific brand impact on top of that, I think is actually quite small. Time for one more, I think. I'm getting a, a two minute sign. Yes, one look back here. Um, hi, my name is Afonso from LinkedIn. Uh, to follow up on that question, um, do you see an impact already of Brexit on the social capital of geographical clustering of talent in Britain today uh, and mobility? Yeah, yes, I mean, most, mostly on London. And, you know, I'm at London Business School. We very proudly, if you look at my logo, you'll see that we have London in bold and business school not in bold, okay? My, my email is pbarwise at london.edu. So I think there's a particular London effect, uh, which uh, I think uh, there has already been some impact. We've also been impacted by, uh, you know, of course the ex exchange rate took an immediate 15% hit. So on things like faculty salaries, 
we've, we've, our competitiveness was sort of somewhat, uh, somewhat impacted. Now, having said that, the FT's just done its MBA rankings. We're, we're number four in the world, actually one above Harvard Business School's very famous uh, MBA, according to the FT. So uh, I think that w our experience, um, I think, is an indicator of the experience of a lot of particularly London-based businesses uh, which are um, very much about global talent. Okay, we're, we're in the global market for students, we're in the global market for faculty. 90% of our students are not British. Um, if you look at the NHS, uh, you know, the NHS has already um, got problems of, of uh, not being able to recruit um, uh, doctors and nurses from within the EU. Uh, the very few doctors voted, voted Brexit. So yes, there is an effect, and we're already seeing it. Having said that, if Brexit goes through, and if it does, I very much hope it's a soft Brexit, not a hard Brexit, then of course, as always, we will manage. I'm now getting the red notice, so I'll um, bid you thank you. Okay.